Hey, what in the world am I doing broadcasting at 5.14 a.m.? Well, I told you I was going to share this journey with you, and today is episode two, and we're going to talk about anxiety. So, why am I talking about this? Uh, I told you I would share the journey with you. So, this uh, latest thing that I have coming up as a side man in another band, besides my own band, uh, Circuline, or any solo work that I'm doing, is a band called 3.2 featuring Robert Berry. So, in case you don't know, uh, Robert Berry was working on Keith Emerson's last album when he passed away, and uh, Robert finished the album. It came out in August of last year on the Frontiers label. It went to number one on Amazon on the first day and sold out in five countries. Uh, it's gotten tremendous reviews, lots of great fan support, and Robert has decided that he's going to tour the record. So fortunately, uh, Robert called me to tour the record. So I am tasked with the daunting task of covering um, Keith Emerson's last album before he passed away. Uh, as many of you know, Keith Emerson, uh, or maybe, maybe you don't know, he's a visual aid for today. This is Prague Magazine, the number one magazine in the world in our genre, and it's got the 50 greatest keyboard players ever. Now, why am I showing you this? Because Keith Emerson was voted the number one keyboard player of all time. And now, I have to cover him. So, what does that do? That might tend to bring up a little bit of anxiety, especially when... Every, every single person, every keyboard player that I just saw at the NAMM show, like last week, when they would say, they would, I went around with Robert and we were meeting people, and every single person would be like, oh, oh, you have that job. Oh, that you. Even Jeff Downs was like, ah, oh, we're going to keep an eye on you. Um, and to make matters better or worse, depending upon how you look at it, I also am covering... Uh, uh, Rick Wakeman, who was the number two keyboard player of all time. Tony Banks, who's the number three keyboard player of all time. Jordan Rudess, because it's a Jordan Rudess version of a Keith Emerson tune called Carnival 9, um, which is this big nine minute epic. It's Carnival 9 First Impression Part 1. Um, so that's four of the top five keyboard players of all time that I've got to cover. I imagine why I might be a little bit nervous. I'm told you I'm sharing this with you. And then also um, we're doing a, doing a Jethro Tull tune. And so John Evan um, was voted the number 40 keyboard player of all time from Jethro Tull. So I've got to cover four of the top five keyboard players in prog rock history. Uh, because Robert also, uh, Robert Berry also, besides the 3.2 material that we're covering and the three material from the 80s, Robert also did a series of uh, tribute albums on the Magna Carta label in the 90s, in the early part of the 2000s, and so we're covering a bunch of Robert's versions of those famous songs. So we've got Yes, uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Genesis, Jethro Tull, uh, Ambrosia, because Robert was in Ambrosia for two years. So there's a tremendous amount of material that I have to cover and prepare for, which leads to a little bit of this. So. How am, how am I, and by the way, I want to try to keep these episodes fairly short. So today's like the intro. Well, there'll be more, more coping things on how I cope with anxiety and how that might help you. Um, so I just kind of want to mention, uh, for me, what I notice is that when I'm actually calm and focused and practicing, I don't feel anxiety. Um, and there's different kinds of anxiety. There's the anxiety um, that I feel or that someone or that you might feel when you're thinking about the job that you have to do, just thinking about the thing, the gig, the tour, um, and then there's also performance anxiety, and we'll talk about that in another episode. Uh, so uh, there's even practice anxiety, um, which we'll get to that in another episode. Again, I'm trying to keep these short. So for me, the number one, the number one way that I handle this is by showing up in the studio and practicing. Because I found that when I'm actually calm and focused and practicing, I don't feel any anxiety at all. Because I'm, I'm just, you know, I want to say zen-like, but I'm focused on what on the job that I need to do. So um, I, I'm a total geek um, when I'm preparing because I want to have as many 
reference points in my brain as possible um, that, so that my brain is fully integrated with lots of anchor points when I get on the stage to, to play. Um, I was in a band for two years with a guy named Ed Fitzgerald, and uh, that band was called Tenth Planet. You might see some uh, uh, releases from that coming at some point in the future because we've got everything from rehearsals and songs anyway. Um, so Ed used to have all these things called Edisms. <clears throat> and one Edism was, if you have to think about it, you've already screwed up. He didn't say screwed up. I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep this family friendly. I'm trying not to swear too much in this channel. But you, you already effed up if you're having to think when you get on stage. Um, and I have to say that when, when I was a, a classical musician in my late teens and early 20s, before I made the transition to all the other things that I do now, I'm going to say that classical performing classical music is as difficult and challenging as it is, almost easier than being a 21st century musician playing rock or being on a stage with lights and lots of people. Usually in the, in the classical world, it's very, it's almost very introspective when you're performing because you're, you're focused, um, there's no distractions, the whole point is to just perform the music as best as you possibly can, and so it's very much only about the music, and a lot of times you have music in front of you, and there might be a, con like I played trumpet for 10 years, there might be a conductor, but it's on, the focus is only on performing the music. Well, in today's world, and especially in the rock world, the progressive world, it's also about an entertainment value for the audience. So you've got, you know, there's some moving and dancing, dancing oh. and singing. Um, there's almost always a light show if you're lucky. There's an audience of people. The other people, musicians on stage are moving around. So there's a lot of things to manage. Um, you know, I've got two keyboards, I've got a rolly seaboard, I've got pedals on the floor. Um, it's, it's, it's really challenging. Um, and my classical training prepared me for the technical part of this job. But um, that, there was nothing that could have prepared me for the rest of the entertainment value that we are expected to bring to the audience, or rightfully so, but as a, as a performer. So that I've had to learn. Um, I'll, I'll give you a quick story. The first time I was on a, on a big stage with a band performing and we had a fabulous light show. And you know, they've got the gobos with stuff spinning around and they have the lights with the things and it looks like a fan, right? And he goes, and so we're playing this intro to this one song and the lights go, Poof, you know, which looks totally awesome, but I had never had that experience before. So I'm playing the intro to the song, and the lights are like, Poof, and I'm like, whoa, cool, look at the lights, wow, and then I screwed up. So, <coughs> you know, not a good thing. So I'm, you know, I need to try to be as bulletproof as possible. So when we have a light show, um, or sometimes you can't see because they turn the lights down, and you can't, it's hard to see what you're doing, or you're sweating, and your fingers are sticking to the keyboard, or whatever, um, you know, uh, that I'm, I'm not going to make a mistake. Uh, another thing is, I, between my pens and pencils and highlighters and my sheet music and my iPad and my computer, um, uh, with all those anchor points, I want to know the music as best I can in case someone else makes a mistake. Because if, if I'm always relying on everybody else's cues, if somebody else makes a mistake and that throws me off, now I'm screwing up. Um, and I don't want to screw somebody else up because they might be relying on my cues. So anyway, um, that's probably enough for today. I, when I, one thing I'm going to do on these shows is I'm going to have gear geek moment because I am a geek when it comes to this stuff. So today's gear geek moment is brought to you by, I wish it was brought to you by, um, today I'm bringing them, um, by Behringer. So I'm using a, we're using the Behringer in-ear monitor box. These things are awesome. Uh, and my Behringer mixer. We are using the XR18. So everything is routed through the XR18. This is what Circuline takes on tour. We use this all the time. It's got, you can control stuff with an iPad. It's very cool. So right now everything, my MacBook Pro and my computer sounds rig, all my keyboards, my vocals, my laptop for the playback for rehearsal, 
that's brought to you by the Behringer XR18, and this thing is called the Behringer P1 personal monitor system. All right, that's your gear geek moment for today. Uh, and that's enough for today. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching, and I'll continue to share these episodes. Thanks for your comments and feedback. And um, I'm Andrew Collier from CollierMusic.com, and we'll see you next time.